Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 512. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast, the podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because here's what I know that you actually already know, but you just may not have thought about. When it comes down to building your business, growing your enterprise, letting the world know that you exist, you probably have some challenges getting the word out. I mean, most of us as entrepreneurs, we're so busy focused on our systems and making sure the widget is awesome, making sure the service actually hits on all the points and pieces that occasionally we have challenge letting the world know the difference that we're making. And and let's be clear, whether you're for-profit, non-profit, wish you had profit, it doesn't matter. You want the world to know you exist. So in some way, shape, or form, you run up against that thing known as public relations, PR. How did they get on the news? And how come people aren't talking about me? And what's interesting is that technology is even changing that game and how that is done. Because you could say, well, I, I don't know all the people, and that's the excuse. that that That's what it is. I don't have all the right relationships. And to a point, that could be true. But I have with me someone today who would venture to say that there's probably more you could be doing, should be doing, and most importantly, has a service that is out there that will help you to do it. I'm, of course, talking about Greg Gallant. Now, many of you may know him uh, from the the Shorty Awards, or you may know his uh, new venture, Muck Rack, which is out there helping individuals like you, like I, Go out there and be smarter with powerful PR and easy-to-use software. Now, some of you, you've been waiting for this. Others of you, you're like, well, I'm still working on the beginning of my business, and I totally understand, but here's what I'm going to say to you. You will still learn because when it comes to building your cash flow, Greg has done it multiple times. So let's get ready to listen Let's get ready to learn and let's get ready to love Greg Gallant. Greg, how you doing? Great. Good to be here, Jay. Uh, glad you are taking the time. Thanks for joining us. So now this being your first time here, I have to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody else. Are you ready? Sure. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, Spider-Man, Batman, Wonder Woman, Robin, etc., Um, And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. For example, there as an entrepreneur, I can envision myself using our products and services, flying around town, saving customers one sale at a time. And yes, I am probably wearing a cape and tights at that particular moment. Also, though, like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. So if you take Spider-Man, for example, there was a time where he was just a kid going to school, doing his thing, taking some photos. Then one day, he gets bit by a spider, discovers, oh my goodness, I have a special ability. And he gets to choose whether to use it for good or for evil. So, my question to you is as follows. Before Muckrack, before the Shorty Awards, before being able to work with companies like Comcast, Pfizer, Chobani, Nike, etc., before all the things that we know you for today, Greg, what we want to know is, who is Greg Gallant? Well, I've been uh, kind of a lifelong entrepreneur. So I um, got started as a bored suburban, actually junior high school student, where um, kind of 
got on the internet really early, originally through dial-up using Prodigy, if you remember that service, an ill-fated uh, competitor to AOL. And they gave everybody free web space. So I spent uh, probably a full day or two learning how to code a website. And then I decided to start offering uh, my services to build websites for companies. And I built the business throughout uh, junior high school and high school. We ended up building the website for a local chain of newspapers, a French philosopher, a clinical trials company, and uh, kept that that business up through um, high school and college. And that that was my first venture and kind of got me into, uh, led me into all the trouble I've gotten into since. (laughs) <laughs> yeah media and trouble that that those two things never go together never never and for those of you wondering dial-up was this thing before you you know just turned on your phone and the internet was already there uh and yes i i do i had never thought there would be a day where mentioning and remembering prodigy would be like dating myself but yeah i i remember that too so <laughs> that's pretty interesting now um take us on this journey if you will how do we go from junior high teaching yourself to code to muckrack i mean there's there's got to be a couple of steps in between there yeah so so actually what happened was as i was keeping my business in college i'd also had the opportunity to spend a summer working at a venture capital firm and then as i was finishing up my senior year i worked at cnn.com as an associate producer and i was uh, stuck in atlanta traffic getting to cnn.com And I hated Atlanta radio. I didn't like my options for what to listen to in traffic. This was in 2005. So it was actually just when the iPod came out. And this might sound familiar to you, but I was thinking, wouldn't it be awesome if we could let people just download MP3s of spoken word content to listen to on their commute? So I looked into it and I saw that there was this idea that you could have RSS feeds with enclosures and some people are calling it podcasts. So I decided in 05, like, let me try launching a podcast and see what happens. So I started what was probably the first podcast about entrepreneurship called Venture Voice. And I had anyone on it from uh, Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, back when LinkedIn was 30 people. I had the founder of Yelp on there when Yelp was just getting going, the founder of the Vanguard Group, Brooklyn Brewery. All these other great entrepreneurs, because I knew having been an entrepreneur, how uh, how lonely it can be and how hungry for information people get. And then actually one of my guests on my podcast, this was back in it's probably 05 or 06, was this entrepreneur by the name of Evan Williams. And he was working on a really hot pre-launch company called Odeo. And if you don't remember it, there's a good reason. They launched Odeo. It itself was supposed to be a podcasting platform, and it ended up being a failure. But I'd stayed in touch with Ev a bit because we were both in the podcasting world. And Ev uh, very cleverly pivoted to a little side project they had called Twitter. So I signed up to Twitter super early because I was in this early podcasting scene and, and was following Ev. I got my first name on Twitter, so I'm just at Gregory on Twitter simply because I was the first Gregory to sign up and go for getting the first name. (laughs) Wow. And I must admit, at first, I was a little skeptical about Twitter, but I saw uh, that there was great content happening on there and that you could find, you know, really interested to kind of find people by topic. So then had the idea, along with my co-founder, Lee Semmel, to launch a um, award show honoring the best of, at first with Twitter, and then you know with the idea that we'd expand out to other forms of social media. And we, we didn't know if it'd really be something, but in two weekends, we had this idea that we could build a platform that let people vote with the tweet. And now that's commonplace, but no one had ever done it before. Mm-hmm. So we launched the, uh, and, and we figured how do we get people to vote with the tweet? We'll call it an award show. So eight dollars later on GoDaddy, we had shortyawards.com. And then we built the website in two weekends, launched it, and within 24 hours, Shorty Awards became the top trending term on Twitter because this idea of voting with the social share was so viral and was so powerful, and no one had done it before. So it was really new to everybody, and people are really intrigued by this idea. Well, yeah. I, I mean it 
<laughs> it's funny to hear about these things post. I mean, I mean, for some, you know, maybe they've recently seen there's a, a, a new special that's been going around called Valley of the Boom, where it, it literally talks about the creation of the Internet and how it all came together and and whatnot. And hearing these things post, it sounds like how could I mean, today, I'm sure people are like, how did you have this idea? How did you know it would work? And what on earth possessed you to think that something like this would would actually happen? And well, and, and I know here's my question. H- how is an award show actually a business? <laughs> oh, great question. So first of all, I didn't know that it would work. And uh, of all the ideas that I've had, I always thought the Shorty Awards uh, was going to be a lot of fun, but I thought it had the least potential as a business. And sure enough, <laughs> ended up being one of my uh, my best ideas. But you know, my philosophy when launching businesses is if if the business is going to take a lot of capital and resources to start up, you know, like you want to open up a uh, grocery store, like, yeah, you better do your research and a big financial plan and all that because it's going to be millions in overheads. And if if it goes wrong, you're going to be stuck with the lease and all that. But if it's a business idea you can try out quickly and cheaply, then don't think about it too much. And that was my thought with the Shorty Awards. I knew like, hey, we could build it in two weekends we'll put it out there. And if, if it has resonance, if people love it, then we'll have to double down and we'll, we'll figure out how to make it work as a business, which we had no idea when we launched it. And then on the flip side, uh, if we put it out there and end up being a big failure, it was just two weekends worth of work. So who cares? We just move on and try another thing. And we've tried lots of things over the years. So that was the the philosophy behind it. In fact, I found in my career, like, The longer I've spent thinking about an idea before I launch it, the worse it does. So there's something to be said for spontaneity. You just totally irritated half the people who have been getting ready to get ready (laughs) for a long, long time. They're like, what? That's not fair. But let's talk about it, for example. Uh, How much did you learn in in the process of of the Shorty Awards, building it, making it? How much was the, it's what I like to call the feedback loop. How valuable was that to get something out there and start to see how the public was going to respond to it? Oh, it was tremendous because we had no idea like which uh, kind of communities within Twitter would be interested. And we've since expanded it to all forms of social media. But in those early days, we had no idea about that. Uh, I mean, we didn't know how to put on a word show. We didn't know if people would want to sponsor it. We didn't know what the business model would be. <laughs> but by getting it out there, it gave us license to uh, to call on all that. And then actually, interestingly enough, that's what led to Muckrack because that first year, uh, and, and just to back up, I've launched a bunch of different things in my career. And I know usually when you launch something like Nobody cares and you got to pound your head against the wall for years before people start caring and you get legitimacy and press. Mm -hmm. The Shorty Awards was the opposite. We saw within 24 hours, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, BBC all contacted us to cover the event and write about it. And in fact, I still remember our office at the time was in Brooklyn. And the Wall Street Journal reporter was like, I'm going to come to Brooklyn. I want to take you out to lunch and learn about this. And back then, this was 10 years ago, nobody wanted to come to Brooklyn. It wasn't cool to have an office there yet. (laughs) So I was like, what's going on here that the press really cares about this thing? And then I saw, I got this early insight from doing the shorties that journalists were using social media, particularly Twitter, but all, all social media, to figure out what to write about, what to cover, and share their news. Mm. And then it was that insight I got from running the Shorty Awards that early on, that first year, that led to the idea for Muckrack. Got it. Got it. Now, quickly, be- be- before we get to Muckrack, because I want to have that conversation, but I also want other people to understand how this idea, like, how did you figure out what the business model is when it was a two weekend project? And you're like, uh oh, this is now a thing. What What is the business model behind a, an award show? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's changed over time. So the first business model 
we went out with was uh, getting sponsors. So that first year, I was just calling everybody I knew, and we ended up getting Pepsi and the Knight Foundation to sponsor it. Wow. And we also sold tickets, but uh, the ticket sales ends up being like 10% of the revenue. So it's really, those first couple of years, it was all about sponsorship. Mm. And then uh, what we found out was actually sponsorship is a really tough business model to have as your primary business model. It's great when you get it, but you know, it comes down to a couple big companies writing you a check and you never know, like, is that company going to... Um, come back the next year we you know a lot of times like you might do an awesome sponsorship and that company changes cmos or they change their agency and they're like okay we're gonna you know just change everything that we're doing or mm -hmm. you know your decision maker there gets fired so it's very stressful those first couple of years because we never knew would the you know would the sponsor even if we had a great relationship with them like would they be there in a year to sponsor it again uh, mm -hmm. So instead, what we saw, and, and I should just back up the way the awards work is people get nominated, uh, they get voted up by the public. These are influencers and celebrities, and uh, they could win. And the people who are the winners don't, um, you know, pay us a dime all along the way. These influencers and celebrities uh, out there, social media personalities, et cetera. Uh, then in the third year, what we saw was that there was this whole... Uh, business building up around social media where brands and agencies were really focusing on doing social media and just more generally digital work. And we saw that within the world of these brands and agencies, they're used to paying entry fees for entering award shows, similar to how you pay an entry fee to apply to a college. Hmm. Uh, and there, there are awards that have been around for decades, like the Clio Awards and the Can Lions, where anytime you want to enter work, you pay a few hundred bucks for your entry fee. That lets you enter it to get it judged by a jury of your uh, of your peers. And then uh, you know, it doesn't guarantee a win. You could enter and still not win anything, but that's how the process works. So what we decided that third year was that we'd keep it free for like it always had been for the celebrities and the influencers because they're individuals. They don't necessarily have a budget and you know, we wanted everyone to get our fair sake even if they didn't have any money. But then for the brands and agencies, we figured we'd just use that same business model that the Can Lion or the Clio's or pretty much any award show has since their company's entering. They all have budgets set aside to enter awards. So it's not like, you know, discriminatory in the sense that anyone can't enter, you know, all, all these big brands have the budget for it. And so we launched uh, that and it took a couple of years to grow, but now actually those entry fees are the primary source of revenue for us. And it's been really powerful because it's thousands of companies paying us a little bit of money. So we're not kind of beholden to any one company. And then we can also count on that cash flow so we could build a staff to run the awards. Awesome. But you know, again, funny enough, I didn't even know that business model existed when we launched the Shorty Awards. Well, and, and that's what I like about stories like this and when talking to the entrepreneurs is that Every person who goes out there to build a business, you, it's it's really important that we don't get locked into it, um, I don't know, being a particular certain way or having a certain vision because we might end up saying, you know, we're, we're saying no because we like we have this vision, but that precludes us from saying yes to something that is ultimately better than what we thought or originally had in mind in the first place. But what I would love for you to speak on before we switch and, and transition into muckrack is talk to us about that, the uncertainty, because there was this time period that you, you state where there was just, you know, uncertainty, but you kept pushing forward. And, and I know that a lot of individuals, you know, maybe they dislike their job or they want more stability in their cash flow, but there was this uncertainty about where that next sponsorship was going to come from, or is this idea going to work and how do we, how do we pivot to, to, to make that happen? All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. And I'm glad that you are enjoying what you are hearing thus far, but here's one of the things that's really important. One of the most important things that you can do as get started. One of the things that I've said before, and I say again, once you get started, stay started, but more importantly, there can be, Lots of roadblocks to getting started. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to remove one of those roadblocks for you and make it a little bit easier. Because the thing that I don't want to stop you is thinking, do I need a local number? How about a long distance number? Or should it be 800? How on earth am I going to make that happen so that people can contact me as I'm out there building my business, making my cash flow grow, but most importantly, understanding that it doesn't have to be difficult. Many of you may know, but if you don't, there's a company out there by the name of Grasshopper. And what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Grasshopper is the entrepreneur's phone system. It works like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware to purchase, no software to install. It's just the number that flat works. So if you are out there building that distributed workforce across many different locations, it's a way for you to still go out there and make your number be unified, simple, easy to use, something we've been using for quite some time. So again, go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Now let's get back to the rest of the story. Yeah, it's a great point. And you know, there is a um, great quote from Warren Buffett, which is, uh, if you want a reputation as a good business person, be sure to get into a good business. And what I take away from that is that, you know, you have to think a lot about like, you know, it, does your business have a good revenue model? In addition, just thinking about, are you executing as well as you can? And so one thing that I, I you know, I really think about heavily with, with uh, making a good business. And I think about this across both the Shorty Awards and Muckrack is, uh, you know, for one, like the revenue diversity that you have. So in other words, avoiding concentration, uh, you know, different people have different guidelines, but essentially like you want to avoid having 10% of your revenue coming from any one customer or, you know, an ideal world, even 5% of your revenue coming from any one customer, because guess what? Any one customer, no matter how good a job you do for them can leave you. And it might be because they go out of business, you know, look at, uh, Sears, uh, which just, right. you know, they could have been your number one client. You could have killed it for them. They're going bankrupt. You're losing them. And now, you know, you'd have to make up a huge chunk of your revenue if you were counting on them. So a big part of it is seeing like, hey, how do we get more revenue diversity? How do we get many more people paying us uh, uh, maybe even a smaller amount of money so that we don't have to worry about any one customer leaving us and jeopardizing the whole business? Well, and and, and I think, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I was just kind of realizing that. And then also, you know, realizing that it can take a while to get there. So (laughs) that was only the third year that we even introduced the entry part of it with brands and agencies entering their best work. And then it took a couple of years after that before it grew to be able to become the the dominant business model over the award, over the uh, sponsorship. So, you know, sometimes you have to play this game like we were were like, hey, we know. Selling sponsorships to an award show is a nice auxiliary business model. It's not a great primary revenue model. Yet here we are. We've got to keep it our primary primary revenue model to keep the lights on while thinking about the future and while thinking about how we diversify our revenue streams. And and I think this conversation is really, really relevant for a lot of individuals who are beginning to create content and or provide, you know, some sort of value in a digital space on a social media platform who are possibly seeking sponsorship in in some way, shape or form just to hear, you know, some of the things that you guys have gone through and most importantly, how you've evolved. Now, you mentioned towards the beginning that when you started with the the Shorty Awards, you were having (laughs) you were like, why is the press interested? What's going on? And how do I get the word out more and all these types of things? Tell us, uh, how did this idea for Muckrack come about and uh, give you, say, hey, you know, the the confirmation, if you will, that, yeah, this is something that the world needs? Basically, what happened was we saw journalists were using social early on because, because of the Shorty Awards. Had it not been for that, we wouldn't have gotten that insight. Uh, and then we saw that there were all, all these journalists on social, but no way to find them all. Mm. So we originally, and, and this is, a, you know, again, kind of goes to this idea of not planning too much, but I, you know, we had this idea that like, hey, we could build a website that just showed you all the journalists on social media and what they're sharing. 
And that was it. We were just like, hey, we can make it. We could. We were sure we could build it in a week. Ended up taking two weeks, but we built it in two weeks. We knew how to build websites, so there were no really hard costs for us, except for that uh, $8 domain name on GoDaddy. <laughs> and then uh, we figured, okay, let's build it and see what happens. It feels like something would be useful to just be able to see all these journals on social because right now there's no way to find them. So we built that, uh, launched it, and then it became very popular with journalists. So we, we ran it for a couple of years just as a free resource site uh, on the side of doing the Shorty Awards and trying out some other business ideas. And then we had over 10,000 journalists request to get listed on Muckrock. And then uh, I kept talking to people who were in public relations. I'd run into people who worked at uh, PR firms or did PR in-house or scrappy entrepreneurs who were just really good at getting press for themselves. And they'd all tell me like, oh, I love using Muckrack. I use it all the time to figure out which journals I should pitch on a story idea. And then it finally hit us like, oh, they're using it to figure out which journals to pitch. And we didn't even build it for that. But what if we actually built a bunch of tools for that and charge for it? It's a subscription <laughs> business model. And, you know, having done the uh, shorties, which is a ton of fun and it's good business, but it was always kind of boom or bust where either you're like in the season, you, you know, you, you make the revenue, you hope you can make enough revenue to cover the expenses and then uh, start over from ground one. And I really wanted to get into a business where it would be subscription uh, product for the customers because then we could just, we just knew, hey, if we just made a great product and gave us awesome, awesome customer service, then by default, the customer will renew and will want to renew. And then it can keep building on itself and have real cash flow to uh, fund growth. Now, and that's what we did. We relaunched Muckrack and, and made it a SaaS platform. So, okay. Now, for those who actually might be familiar uh, and already familiar or possibly uh, have heard of other services, uh, what would you say would be the, the biggest differentiator? Because this time, as opposed to inventing, we'll say inventing something new, i.e. going with the, the, the Shorty Awards, this time, though, you, you also have companies or at least services that I've heard of like uh, Haro, Help a Reporter Out, out there. And now you're looking at a different landscape, potentially, when you go out there. And there could be confusion in the marketplace between the two. And how do you differentiate yourself and, and, and deal with those challenges? Sure, yeah. So the big difference between Muckrack and Haro, and, and Haro, Help a Reporter Out, awesome service. Uh, I love it and recommend it. Uh, but the idea with Haro is a journalist goes there and they'll post on it and say, hey, I'm looking to cover, you know, I'm looking to write about uh, plant food. If you know a plant food expert, uh, come pitch me. And that's great when it happens. But the problem is, you know, 90, you know, probably 99 percent of articles like the journalist doesn't think to request the source on Haro. They either come up with the story idea on their own. They get pitched the story idea, you know, maybe it's serendipity. They see something cool spreading on social, like in the case of the shorties. So, you know, the idea was like beyond these services like Hara, where the, you know, you wait for the journals to explicitly request the source. How do you let a company be proactive about finding the right journals to talk to about a story idea? Okay. And so our idea. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I think you're about to answer oh, yeah, my yeah. question. <laughs> Sure, yeah. So our idea was uh, let's index all the tweets, all the journalists write, and all the stories they write, and then make that searchable. So we run a search engine, kind of like Google, but it's all for finding the right journalist. And so the old way of doing things was that uh, you know, you'd say, hey, I'm going to launch, um, uh, you know, let's say a, uh, you know, you know, a new iPhone app. So I'm just going to look up which journalists write about tech and then, you know, start pitching tech journals. But in reality, a lot of those tech journalists, maybe they only cover enterprise software. So they're never going to write about your consumer iPhone app. So our big idea was like, if we index everything they wrote, you could do super specific targeting of journalists based on what they've written about or tweeted about in the past. You could go on there and say, Hey, let's say I'm launching an iPhone app and it's similar to, um, you know, it's a fitness tracking app. So if a journalist wrote about uh, Map My Run, 
they'll probably write about my fitness tracking app. So you can go to Muckrack, search for all the journals that have uh, written about Map My Run. You could search for the journals that are tweeting that they're using Map My Run. You could say, hey, I want to find the journals that are writing about Map My Run and also talking about Under Armour because I think if they've covered those two things, they'll probably want my thing. And then right through Muckrack, build that media list of all those really relevant journalists and actually customize and send emails to them, seeing if they want to write about you. Yeah, and and, and that's exactly what I was thinking, is that the company, when they wanted to <laughs> take control, so to speak, or do their best to be, as you said, proactive in figuring out how to make that happen, because, yeah, we we could be, you know, our service or product or whatever it is that we're bringing to the table could be something that's completely new, and we don't necessarily know who we just know that somebody would like to know about this or we would like more people to know about this so talk to us a little bit about what's what's the best way for say uh, an entrepreneur to be able to uh, approach the journalist i mean we're obviously we're going to use you know muckrack to figure out which ones that we need to talk to but do you guys go so far as to help those of us who are, are seeking uh, some of this PR to actually know what to say and how to make uh, our pitch more effective? Sure. Well, the number one thing for entrepreneurs to remember when they're pitching journalists is that the journalists are human beings. So, you know, of course, you, you got to be really kind of uh, personable and, and thoughtful in your outreach to them. You got to know they're busy and also that they, they, cover a beat, they have an audience, and every morning they're waking up and they have a big problem, which is, what do I write about? They got to find stuff to write about all the time. So if you send them a really relevant pitch, you're helping them. If you're not doing your research and you send them an irrelevant pitch, then you're uh, you're making their lives more difficult and they get a lot of junky pitches already. But having said all that, when, when you do pitch a journalist, uh, you have to remember as an entrepreneur, you actually have a big advantage because the journalists are always getting pitched by, uh, you know, PR pros. Uh, and, it, you know, it's great to use PR pros. You can afford it. Uh, but they're always getting pitched, you know, by people whose job it is to pitch them. And they generally love hearing from an entrepreneur uh, because, you know, it shows the passion. Uh, they like hearing that, you know, you're putting yourself out there and you're pitching it because you have, you, you believe in this great idea. And you're not just doing it because you're getting paid to do it. So you've got that going for you. <laughs> right. But then there are a few hurdles to overcome that a lot of entrepreneurs have trouble with. You know, one is really thinking like, is what you're doing news? And, you know, is uh, the aspect of it that you're telling the journalist news? So a lot of times, you know, we get. <laughs> well, so hold on excited. a second, Greg. It's news to me, though. You don't understand. This is a big deal in my life. How do we... Exactly. You, your mother, your <laughs> exactly. wife, uh, the three friends you go drinking with, it's news to them. How do you... Okay, so on that topic, though, how, how does one d determine? I mean, because we, we, we have a strong, we'll say, bias uh, towards our idea, our widget, our baby, if you will. How on earth can we even begin to determine is... Are the because the, the the journalist has the a customer base that has you know thousands of people. How can we begin to determine that? Yeah, there thousands of other people are going to be interested. Now we believe they should be. Of course, that's why we made the product in the first place. That's why we're developing the service. That's why we're doing the cause because we think everybody should be. But how do they make that determination? Yeah, it requires a, a bit of picking up a nose for news. But, you know, one thing I, I would suggest is try boiling. The biggest area I see entrepreneurs go wrong is like they write up why they're things special and it's, you know, 10 paragraphs. You can't really understand <laughs> what they're talking about. I've seen so many pitches from entrepreneurs where I look at the pitch and I'm like, I don't even know what you're pitching. So what, what I would suggest is try getting it down to like a tweet. I mean, don't tweet it, but See if you can describe what your, you know, what's newsworthy about your company in one sentence. And then run that by some friends, run that by some, you know, grab someone random at a coffee shop, someone who's not, you always have the people in your life who are going to say anything you do is awesome and it's so special because you're doing it. But run it by someone who's objective. 
and see like you know tell, like is there anything new about this is there some cool hook to what you're doing that makes it totally different are you the first one to open up uh a coffee shop in a neighborhood that might be news if you're the 10th coffee shop and it's just cool because you're doing it that's probably not news and that'll come out when you have to really boil it down or you know is your coffee shop the only coffee shop that has uh uh you know a cup of coffee with twice the caffeine as everyone else or something <laughs> that, that sounds cool you know the hook you know is there a hook to it yeah so that that's what you have to get and i think just forcing yourself to write the headline almost write it as that one sentence and see like is there something really here or am i just you know um uh you know am i just caught up in my own uh bs <laughs> no that would never happen uh, so, you know, what What I like, though, about your journey specifically is it's really clear to see how what you did prior informs what you do in the present, uh, because, you know, starting with building a site, then taking that information and turning it into uh, the, the Shorty Awards and then taking that what you learned there and turning that into Muckrack, it, it, it only begs the question um, how long before we see the next creation from Greg? Oh, that's uh, that's confidential. You have to follow me on uh, Twitter to find that out. But, <laughs> that's know, also code I'll for you to have an idea, don't you? I know you do. Well, you... Well, I'll tell you, I, I have dozens of ideas, but right now I'm in a mode of uh, really focusing and executing on these two that work, Muckrack and the Shorties. And within them, there's a million things we're doing. We're launching new features all the time within Muckrack and uh, finding out various ways to extend the Shorties and better serve our audience. But the thing that I've learned is that you have to be able to switch between modes. So you have to, at some point in a startup, uh, be in an exploratory mode, which we were in when we came up with the Shorties and Muckrack. And, you know, we launched uh, 10, I mean, over 10 other ideas during that time. Also, we were building them in a week or two, seeing that they'd stick, and we killed a lot of stuff that didn't work. So, you know, there's sometimes when you have to be in the exploratory mode, and you don't yet have something. So you're like, let's put a bunch of stuff out to the world and see what works. You know, think about like when a when a network wants to develop a new sitcom, like, they don't just have the idea for Seinfeld. They piloted piloted 10 shows and one of them was Seinfeld and nine of them never connected with an audience or went anywhere. So there was that exploratory mode that we were in. And, you know, by nature, I mean, I love launching stuff. You know, it's hard for me to switch <laughs> modes because I, I just love launching stuff. Right. But then I saw like, hey, we've got these two things. They work. They have an audience. But if we're really going to take them to the next level... It's going to take focus. We need priorities. We need to build a team. Uh, we need to have a lot of consistency. So that's the mode I've been in for um, the past several years is just total focus on these two businesses. And then each one has a dedicated team that's 100% focused on them. And that's what really made it work in scale. So, you know, right, right now I'm in the uh, focus and scale mode. Uh, but, you know, I, I love... Uh, coming up with ideas and talking about them over drinks. And then one day, who knows, maybe I'll start uh, start making some of them happen. Oh, I, I can hear it in your voice. It's already brewing, but that's good. We'll, we'll save that for another time. Uh, for those, though, that have listened this far and, uh, you know, want to find out more about what you're up to and what you might be up to in the future, uh, what's going to be the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, so... Uh, Check out Muckrack, just muckrack.com, M-U-C-K-R-A-C-K.com, or shortyawards.com, S-H-O-R-T-Y, A-W-A-R-D-S.com. And for me personally, as I said, I'm just at Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y, on both Twitter and Instagram. So you can follow me on either of those and uh, hear what I'm up to, or you know, just tweet at me, at Gregory, and happy to answer any questions. Got it, got it. Now, as we wind down, I've got a final question for you because I'm kind of curious to hear your answer. Let's pretend that someone listening is, uh, they, they reach what I like to call the precipice of decision, Greg. They're, they're now at that point. They've listened this far and they go, you know what? If Greg can do this with no planning, so can I. 
I'm going to make something mm-hmm. happen because I, it's done. My idea, my time is right now. I'm, I'm going to go and get it done. Now, you know, like I know, Greg, that when we reach these moments of decision, we often have a companion and that companion comes in the form of a voice. And it's a voice that reminds us, oh, you're going to do what? Oh, you? I don't think anyone's going to care about your awards you're gonna get PR no one's going to care about your story and it reminds us of all the things that didn't work and for some people they're actually related to that voice so my question to you is as follows let's pretend that this time it's going to be different they're actually going to follow through and they're going to follow through in the next 24 to 48 hours Greg they're going to do exactly what you say so my question to you is as follows what should they do I'd really think through the worst case scenario. So if you've got a business idea like ours where it's, hey, let's put up a website that we know, you know, the costs are going to be very limited. Uh, in this case, it was mostly our time and you know, $10 for a domain name. And I mean, in truth, you know, maybe we spent a couple hundred bucks on uh, hosting and other stuff, but we didn't, it wasn't thousands or tens of thousands of dollars just to try it. Uh, then, you know, think through the worst case. Like, let's say you spend two weeks of your life. Let's even spend, say you spend, you know, $5,000 trying this idea. If you have, you know, as long as you have some savings, which hopefully um, you, you do by that time or, you know, you have some source of income, then, you know, think through like, okay, if it doesn't work, is it that I'm a failure in life or that I just tried an experiment? You know, I kind of bet the, the $5,000 in the two weeks of my life and it didn't work. And if you think through and you think, hey, the worst case scenario isn't that bad, then you can listen to that voice and you can even say you might be right to it, but I'm going to try it anyhow because I got nothing to lose or I can at least bear the loss. And there's a good chance that uh, th- there's a really good upside to it. Yeah, totally get that. Totally get that 100%. And, and I definitely appreciate the just the way that you attack problems, the way that you carry what the the positive things that you've learned from the past into the future. And yet at the same time, you're, you're creating opportunities where none existed before because there will be individuals who are listening to you and using services like Muckrack to be able to get the word out. And that that's uh, enabling others to be the change agents that we desire to be is, I, I think, a noble cause uh, for sure. And I definitely want to be the first to thank you for taking your, your time to share your knowledge, your wisdom, and your insight here with us today at the Cashflow Diary. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on, Jay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means get over to muckrack.com. Get over to the shortyawards.com. Why? Because you know you were inspired. You're like, he spent how much time in planning? He did what? And yeah, it can happen like that. But go listen to the marketplace. You can hear how his decisions are informed by feedback. And you must, when building your cash flow, listen to your customer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>